Uh, it's really uh, it's a great pleasure to come back here to Berkeley. Uh, uh, let me first thank uh, Professor uh, Shankar Sastri and Professor Yima for your know, warm invitation. And uh, uh, he told me that the, the weather in Berkeley has been not very good. And, uh, I woke up this morning and I realized I just brought the sunshine from Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, today my talk is going to be uh, about the computer vision and something I have been working on and with my colleagues for the uh, last several years. Uh, I haven't seen Jitendra yet, so uh, I really want to wait until Jitendra is here, then talk about something about computer vision. But before Jitendra arrives here, uh, let me just uh, steal a few minutes of your precious time, uh, do a little bit of uh, shameless promotion of my lab and you know, Microsoft Research you know, in Beijing. Uh, because nowadays I also wear the hat as the uh, Microsoft Research Asia's managing director. It's actually part of my job uh, to shamelessly promote the lab. Yeah. Uh, uh, we actually started the Microsoft Research in Beijing uh, a little over eight years ago, and uh, uh, as uh, one of the five research labs for Microsoft, our mission is just exactly the same as other labs. They are really three parts. First of all, we do basic research, just like all of you here in Berkeley. And the second thing, being an industry research lab, we need to transfer rapidly the technology that we create into Microsoft products. The third one is probably the most difficult part. That's really you know, the reason we actually have this insurance of Microsoft Research in Microsoft is really help you know, the company whether we can ensure Microsoft products have a future. And uh, we face challenges every day, and uh, especially those competitors from California. And uh, currently uh, in Microsoft Research Beijing, and uh, we uh, uh, have uh, about 300 full-time staff members. About 200 of us are we call the researchers, very much like uh, the professors and the research staff here in Berkeley. We also have about 100 software engineers. Their job is to turn Microsoft research uh, uh, technology into products. Uh, among those people, we have about 70 uh, hired from overseas. Uh, the, the official language in the lab is really English. Uh, we have about 15, 20 people in the lab who don't speak Chinese at all. Um, so it really forces us to use English as the official, official language there. And also Microsoft Research Asia is uh, gradually turning into more like a graduate school because we have about uh, 350 interns any time of the, the year. If you go to my lab and you will see about 350 students, mostly we handpicked uh, from the top universities in China. And of course many of those student interns eventually move on uh, uh, to study and work in the United States. Many of my former interns are actually here in Berkeley. Um, very quickly, I want to give you a very quick uh, overview of what we do in Microsoft Research Asia there. And we start with technology research, and then we do transfer and uh, move technology into products. And then we also do something we call the product incubation. Think about the, the holes, you know, what's not there in Microsoft product line that should be there. So we do a little bit of incubation there. And uh, until recently, a lot of pro the technology that we create in Microsoft pretty much is in-house and we just use internally. And recently we changed the tactic a little bit and now a lot of technologies we also license out to other companies as well. Especially we you know, create a lot of technology in Microsoft Research. It's very unlikely that all those technologies can be consumed by the Microsoft product team. Uh, last year, for instance, I did four deals uh, from the techn using technology from my lab with companies in UK and in China. Uh, so it has been uh, some early success there. I will also talk a little bit about the university relations and the internship program. I assume uh, professors and the students here might be interested. Uh, so we, uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, Harry, what did you do in Beijing? And they just ignore you know, this side. To say we basically you know, focused on six you know, major areas and in, in Beijing, you know, covering most part of you know, fundamental you know, computer science. And the lab started with two areas of concentration, user interface and digital media, uh, recognizing that you know, a lot of East Asia users, like Jap Japanese, Korean, and Chinese, and we actually like to use handwriting more than Americans do. And we also have this you know, problem of speech recognition and the language models that are just different. And then we later on, we moved on to focus a lot of our research in uh, uh, digital entertainment and the uh, system and the networking. Uh, uh, last uh, three to five years, we have really focused a lot of work on the internet and the inter internet services 
and the search and the advertisement. Last October, we announced that there's a major new area uh, we get into is the theoretical computer science. I'm uh, uh, very grateful to a, a very good friend of mine, the Professor Andrew Yao, who moved from Princeton to Tsinghua. Now he's our chief advisor for our new theory group. Uh, we're slowly building, and we already hired a guy from Stanford, and we're in the process of uh, hiring a young guy from MIT. If we can hire one more person from Berkeley, we'll be complete. <laughs> So suddenly we publish a lot of papers, and I used a uh, sample uh, 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 no, from no, last year, actually not last year, 2005, and a number of papers you know, from uh, uh, the Beijing lab. And uh, there are many other you know, areas we get into as well. There are just a few examples. For instance, uh, SIG IR in 2005, we actually had uh, uh, 12 papers. And this year I was just told that the WWW conference, uh, we, we, this time we have uh, six papers uh, accepted, uh, probably the most. You know, uh, among all the research institutes. And we also got a lot of coverage you know, from the, the press, especially the, uh, from the press in the U.S. And uh, I guess people are just fascinated that you know, all of a sudden there are some you know, people in China who are, actually can do some research. Yeah. So that was uh, actually one article, um, uh, 2004, 2004, yeah, yeah, June of 2004. Uh, uh, MIT Technology Review, the couple of, uh, uh, that, this uh, editor, uh, Greg, who went to Beijing to visit us for a day. But he, after he got there, he really liked us, so he extended his stay there for a week. Then he went back to MIT, just, he said, hey, Harry, I'm going to write something. I certainly didn't know what he's going to write. And the June uh, 2004, I was at the Toronto airport after giving a talk you know, in Canada and uh, on my way back to Beijing. I was at, walked into the newsstand, then I saw this article. I looked at that, I almost fell on the ground. <laughs> and then I look, I get out of my wallet and get out of my money, then I talked to the lady you know, no, no, who owns the newsstand. I said, may I have all your copies? <laughs> <laughs> and she, she took, a, she took my, all my money first. Then she smiled and said, may I ask you why? <laughs> I said, I said, lady, no, you, you, you don't understand. See those two people? They work for me. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, I was really curious. And I mean, you know, why, why we were called the hottest computer lab? You know, it was really you know, halfway over the Pacific Ocean. Then I realized and I, I understood why we were called the hottest computer lab. As you may or may not know, you know Microsoft is a very cheap company. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, being a very typical frugal Chinese I am, and, uh, and uh, in a very hot summer you know, in Beijing, I sometimes shut down the air conditioning in the lab. So, <laughs> I mean, that's actually true. But it's not really I want to shut down the con air conditioning. Sometimes they run out of power in Beijing. Eh? So we, we are being a corporate research lab. We really have to focus a lot of our energy on product, product you know, collaboration. And uh, uh, we have uh, come up with a number of innovative ways you know, how we actually work together with product teams. Not to mention that most of our product partners are actually 7,000 miles away from Beijing. So there are a lot of things that we have tried, and that's why we have, you know, in addition to 200 researchers, we also have 100 developers in my lab. So, so we have done a lot of things, and it's just a laundry list of a lot of things. And we, we're certainly very proud about you know, publishing more than 1,500 papers, but I would say I'm more proud, even, even more proud about the number of technologies that have already contributed to almost every product line in Microsoft. And, uh, uh, that's something I assume you know, people here will be very interested in, is actually the impact to academia. When we started the lab 80 years ago in China, and uh, my boss tried to recruit me to move to China, and I refused, and I said, you know, he said, well, let's go to China, build a first-class research lab. And I just laughed at him out of my office. I said, unlike you Americans, I actually came from China. I know what's going on in China, and there's no way that we can build a first-class lab in China. And it, 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 it did take us a long time to realize there is a chance, there is a potential to build that. But one thing we feel really uh, you know, uh, proud and uh, you know, being there in China, in Asia, that we can make an impact, a lot of impact to the local universities local academia. In particular, being in China, we can really impact a lot of universities, particularly students. And uh, over the years, last 80 years, we have had more than 2,000 students going through our internship program. I mentioned that some of them now are here in Berkeley, 
And I was just told by uh, MIT that this year, three of our interns actually accepted by EECS of MIT. I don't know how many Jitendra accepted you know, here. <laughs> I will protest if you accept less than, uh, fewer than three. And, uh, uh, we, uh, we collaborate with all those universities very well. Let me just give you an example of what we do in China. And uh, by now, we have formed uh, nine joint labs with top Chinese universities. The, f the first five labs we formed seven years ago, a few years later, actually, they did so well. Chinese government, Ministry of Education, uh, and, and, and I talked. And they absorbed the top five university joint labs as this uh, so-called uh, MOE, Ministry of Education, you know, key labs. It shows the status that they are really the best computer science labs in China. And we continue to you know, you know, add a few more. And the last one I'm particularly proud, you know, with the Beijing Film Academy. And uh, we actually, uh, that, that's, that's where you see most of the beautiful Chinese actresses from. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that's why my wife questioned you know, why I go there to teach. You know. <laughs> and we also work very closely with top Japanese universities. And uh, uh, we announced the Microsoft Institute for Japanese Academic Research Collaboration. We formed a Japanese advisory board with senior professors like our dear Katsuyi Keuchi and uh, many others. And we're also doing a lot of things with the uh, Korean as well. And uh, we've, we signed uh, an agreement with Korean MOE, uh, so uh, taking a lot of Korean interns to Microsoft as well. And uh, of course, you know, when you have students, most important thing is actually having fun. And uh, I don't know, you know how many free Ubers I have to supply every day, but uh, uh, just uh, you know, uh, most important thing is you know, re remember they are still kids, and uh, you know, they should have fun. Uh, so the, my last slide here is really to encourage all of you here and uh, uh, you know, uh, Jitenji visit us once, but you should really visit us more often. And all of you here, you are very welcome to visit us and visit the lab. You know, for the faculty members, please think about you know, spending the sabbatical you know, with us as well. And the most important thing, of course, you have to climb the Great Wall if you haven't done that yet. You should remember, you, you, you can only become a great man after climbing Great Wall. So. <laughs> Finally, this is a book about the lab in the, uh, by Buderi and Huang recently. It's called Guanxi, and uh, that really means the art of relations. So with that, and the, most importantly, Jitendri is already here, so I'm going to switch to my real talk. Yeah. OK. It's uh, something about you know, uh, uh, you know, computer vision, my own research field. And uh, over the years, you know, I have been working uh, somewhere in the boundary of vision and the graphics. Uh, I always tell people that I'm, I'm really a computer vision guy pretending you know, doing some computer graphics work. And uh, you will understand that, that why I'm saying that after this talk. So, so the computer vision problem is so difficult. And it's just, uh, it's just uh, from the very beginning, you know, we just set up those yield-defined problems. I asked the Chetanjian, you know, why we have this kind of pro difficult problems. And the Chetanjian smiled and said, you know, job security. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you, you cannot solve that before we all retire. Yeah, so, and uh, then you have you know, people looking at a very similar problem from other fields, let's see, picture coding. You know, uh, so the, and I, I, for many years, I really admire you know, people who are not working in computer vision, you know, particularly those that are working in similar fields, like coding and also in computer graphics. Like, say, in picture coding, if you take a look at this picture here, then you say, well, what we really want to do is to use, say, the least number of bits to really code this picture, such that it can recover it, you know, whether it's lossy or lossless. And uh, so it's really good. You always get some kind of result if you think about the coding, right? In the coding, in my opinion, it's more like you know, squeezing this orange. Right? It just gets every bit out. Then, the, but the computer vision is a lot difficult. You know, then we look at this kind of picture and say, well, you know, what did you see from this picture? And uh, we even go further, say, did you see a dog here? Yes, you do. But then if you go on, you say, can you mathematically define what a dog is? We should all ask Jitendri this question. <laughs> can, 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 can we mathematically define that? And, you know, with all the brain power in this room, with all the brain power of you know, Berkeley students and the professors, I would challenge that. We still don't know how to write that. So that's unfortunate. But it, somehow, you know, we human beings have this ability to say, yes, I see a dog. And this is the lovely dog here. I can even move the dog out of that picture. So that's what's going on. So it's so difficult that you know, it's because 
you know, over the years you know, in computer vision, we always try to come up with some kind of automatic algorithms that we just say, well, we know there's a dog there, and we can you know, segment the dog out of this picture. But the, the holy grail of computer vision is something we call you know, image understanding. You know, and a, a simple version of saying that is really, you know, do we know there's a dog there? Right? You know, where is the dog? Can we come up with an automatic algorithm in the system that input is the image, output is the dog? So obviously, it's very, very difficult. And uh, so I have been trying to, you know, working on this problem and with many of my colleagues you know, for many, many years and painfully realized it's just so difficult because we don't even know the definition of a dog. So last three, five years, I have been thinking from a very different angle. That is, you know, why do we even bother? to think about this very difficult automatic algorithm or automatic system. I should say automatic system. Because whatever automatic system there, you, you are trying very hard to hardwire some human knowledge there anyway. right? Some human prior you, know, you are trying to incorporate there. A different way to think about that is actually step back to so say, well, maybe computers are not smart enough yet. How about we have the human in the loop? Let's say the problem of the computer vision, you know, to solve those, all the computer vision problems, whether it's stereo or segmentation, is that we want to design the user interface. So the main objective becoming designing a user interface, such that, such that we can incorporate every possible constraint that we thought about before. At the same time, we have the human telling us what exactly a dog is. So that's really, you know, the, the, is really you know, the, the key here is actually thinking about all those computer vision problems, all computer vision problems, in a different way. That's what I call the interactive computer vision. You present to the user a user interface. That's all. That's the key. You know. Then, of course, you need all those wonderful vision algorithms and the mathematic you know, computational engine underneath to help you to achieve that. So I hope I can convince you by the end of my talk that you know, that's something you know, we, we you know, feel very excited about. So last three, four, five years, you know, we have been working in this area and we, most of our papers are you know, published in the CGraph community. You know, it seems to me that the, that particular community appreciate this kind of interactivity more than you know, our computer vision community. And uh, so we worked on image editing, video editing, you know, interactive image-based modeling, and others. And because of the time, so I'm going to focus on today two projects that we worked on in the CGraph 204 and the CGraph 205. Let me start with the, a very, very simple system and it's called the lazy snapping. So what we do is actually really image segmentation. So suppose we have a picture like this, another lovely dog but different, and uh, <coughs> so we want to segment the dog out, then composite to a different you know, image as the background. So that's what we want to do. So people have worked on this problem for ages, years, you know, many, many years, and uh, you know, certainly you know, automatic vision systems are difficult to achieve that. So you have tools, you know, graphics tools like Adobe Photoshop, and there are some wonderful tools like you know, Intelligent Caesar. The basic idea is you do it interactively. You try to cut, try to go just pixel by pixel, and go get the boundary and the painfully to get the results. And sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you have to go back to try to revise and correct things like that. It typically, in the image like this, even if you are experienced, it may take you quite a few minutes to get the results you would like. So I hope to show you something that we did at the SIGGRAPH 204 and how easy it is to do this kind of segmentation with the right user interface. With only two strokes, I can get the boy out. Well, then you say, well, I actually want the boy and the pumpkin. I say, that's fine. You get the pumpkin and you know, specify the background. Then you get the boy and the pumpkin out. So it's a very simple system in the image snapping system. And I call it lazy snapping because I really want to build a system. You know, even my lazy graduate student can do it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no offense to the young, brilliant minds here. Yeah. So I'm only referring to those uh, Chinese students. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, so, so all I'm doing here is that with the yellow stroke indicating what I want, then with this blue st yellow stroke say, okay, boy is what I want. Then blue stroke is what I don't want. So what's really happening? What, what's really happening behind the scene, you know, underneath here? 
there is actually very powerful mathematics you know, algorithm behind this. And of course, you know, there's something that other people, you know, mathematicians and, uh, and uh, some other recent researchers have already worked on. You know, Boykoff and his colleagues in ICCV201 already worked on something called interactive graph cut. Look at this as pixels and then the image like this. You know, what's going on is that if you draw a stroke, if you draw a stroke like this and the continuous, but then you get this discretized to all those pixels. They say, wow, those pixels are really what I want. Then you draw another stroke like this and say, that's something I don't want. So then the image segmentation you know, can be formulated as a graph cut problem. You cut the graph to the left side and right side, and uh, so that's basically what's going on. And the Jitendra and a lot of uh, the Jitendra students and colleagues here in Berkeley really are the, the, the experts in this particular topic. But the, this, the, the, the graph cut algorithm here, you know, Boykoff, those people, and the, we look at what they did, basically just took it over. You know, that particular algorithm they developed, and they look at that, say, wow, this is, after all, just the energy minimization problem. And the, to do this segmentation, you need to you know, really consider two terms here, energy terms here. One is actually, for each pixel, how similar it is with respect to those you know, blue given the blue pixel or the yellow pixel there. And the other thing is for any pixels nearby, you know, they got to be coherent. I mean, it's physics, right? It's just physical constraints. And if they are, simi if they are spatially similar, spatially similar, and in terms of color and appearance, they should be also very likely similar. So with that, and you just do this per pixel cut that the Boykoff did, and then you get the results. The problem with this per pixel cut is the speed. You know, when they published the paper in 201, it took them you know, no, no seconds to minutes to really get the result. So that's not interactive speed yet. Then you have to wait for a while to get the result. So that's not good. So we look at that system and say, well, maybe we can do a little bit of engineering work and just to speed up, just to speed things up. And the one way to do that is to pre-segmentation, just to segment the original image into image blobs, like using the watershed algorithm, things like that. Then we can look at those blobs, the regions, that actually got highlighted as red and the blue. And then the original big graph of all those pixels becomes a much smaller graph with those big nodes like that. Then again, the problem becomes a graph cut problem, just like this. You do the graph cut again, and you get the red and the blue nodes. And you go back to the original image with the, the pre-segment pre image boundary, then you get the refined results. You know. So slightly different from the per pixel cut, but by and large, you know, it's very similar. But now, of course, it's a lot faster because we, everything we do actually based on regions. And uh, uh, nothing is free. You know, we have to pay. Uh, no, this, the, 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 this, uh, pay, we just have to pay the price you know, for doing this pre, uh, segmentation and the pre-processing. But fortunately, it doesn't take too much time to do the pre-segmentation. The, the faster algorithms are already there. Advantage now we have is that it's a lot faster. Now we you know, come up with this interactive you know, system, as you have seen you know, from that video. You know, once you draw those strokes, as soon as you release the mouse, you, know, you got there. But that's not complete yet. Now, now we have this difficult case where you actually have two uh, you know, boys with dark hair you know, next to each other with this kind of strokes interface. You know, it just doesn't work very well. You see that it gets stuck at some kind of local minimum. It's not very stable, right? It just, but then you know, I would say, you know, you know, I would ask the audience, even if you look at them, uh -huh. it's very difficult to do too, right? So that basically motivates us to add another different kind of user interface you know, to help this. That's why we actually propose to use brush. You know, how about we actually use the brush? You know, we think maybe around here. Then limit the search range and to do a better job like this. You know. And uh, what we are really doing is introduce a band of uncertainty and uh, then we do the search inside you know, this stroke, the, the green line. You know, imagine that it's really the, the, you know, the brush here. Mm -hmm. Then you do, a sec do an optimization, get a better result. You could even edit each polygon vertex, and you move the polygon vertices along you know, with this uh, uh, band as well. Then you re-optimize, and you get the result. So it's a very, very simple system, and uh, you can even think you know, in a way of divide the conquer, and you can get that. The first step is really very quick object marking using a couple of strokes. Then you get the result. And for instance, I show you an example. You know, we have seen enough dogs, and now we see some cats. So, 
like when I draw two strokes, and I find that actually the, the foot is missing, and also the ear is missing, and I get that. With only four strokes, and uh, you get a very nice looking cat that you can use to send it to your grandma or someone. Yeah. Just like that. So, and, uh, but the, sometimes that may not be as simple as this. So I show you another example that, well, if the cost boundary is not good enough, then we could move on then do the refinement, like what we just introduced. And this is an example, say, if I say that this part of the pigeon is not perfect, I just use the brush, then the optimization is done, and I get that. I can also move to some places, say, oh, this vertex is not good, and I move that, then it's actually you know, minor optimization going on, continue to revise, you know, refine this boundary here. Uh, we, did a, we did a user study, and we found that most, most users, actually with the first step, that was more than good enough, and they're just happy with the results. You know, it's depend, really depending on the application. But there are always people who are picky. You know, they need to get the nearly perfect results, so you have to provide this kind of tools. This system has been, uh, uh, and, uh, along with other techniques from Microsoft Research, being in, uh, incorporated into a Microsoft product called Expression. So if you get a chance to try, and uh, the technology is there. <coughs> let, me, let me try to just uh, very quickly you know, summarize you know, what, what, what we really did in this system. I want to point out a very crucial, crucial fact that there is almost nothing new in terms of algorithm. It is virtually nothing new. Yes, we speed things up. Yes, we did a good engineering work. No, but the mathematics is nothing new, and the, the, even the algorithms we used mostly, you know, we, we took from other people. What's really new here is recognizing that the user, user interface is the most important. To get, this, to get this segmentation right, you have to have a way to incorporate the human prior. And the, the clever user interface is what we really need. So the clever, natural user interface is what we need to incorporate this kind of human prior. Then with all those powerful met the computational engine behind strong vision algorithms to incorporate the context from the image, then we get the result. It's important that also we can have this kind of instantaneous feedback, very fast feedback, such that I look at the result of the cat segmentation, I say, ah, a foot is missing, a year, an ear is missing. Then I can add there, immediately get the result, continue to revise. So it's very, very important to think about the whole problem as user interface. So that's a simple example. And uh, so maybe you're not convinced yet. So I move on with another example and uh, you know, a, a different you know, interactive system that we have built in SIGGRAPH 205. I still remember when two of my students you know, walk, walking down the podium after SIGGRAPH 204 presentation. I was wondering, you know, I was pondering in the, in the audience, I was watching their presentation, they, they did really well. But I was looking at that example, that's dog. And I realized that now we can do segmentation pretty well, interactively. The dog is now gone, happy, go to a different house, maybe more beautiful. But what about the original picture? So the original picture now, you actually have a black hole here, very big. And that's not a picture that we like to show people, <laughs> right? What's going on? And uh, so it's a big missing region here. You know, that's probably we should be able to just fill it up. Something we call the image completion, and then we have a known region just like this. So wouldn't it be that nice if we can come up with an image like that? And I, I want to point out, I didn't take a picture like this after the dog is gone. <laughs> I didn't even know where the original picture is from. I'm always worried that and someone may accuse me of copyright. And uh, so that's actually the result. That's what we want to achieve. Well, people in computer vision and the graphics have worked on this problem you know, for the last five some years. And the most of the work has been you know, pretty much is a PDE based, per pixel based you know, work. Very nice work, you know, in the name of, say, image in painting. You look at those results, they're really, really nice. And especially if you have only a few pixels missing, or if the missing region is small and very thin and like that. Why? Well, it's PDE based, you know, it makes sense, right? I mean, you think about the simplest case about the missing, feeling missing pixel could be, say, one pixel missing. What are you going to do? You add the neighbors, divide by eight. You know, simplest the PDE you get. And, uh, but what really motivated us and inspired us is recent work in, along the line of texture synthesis. 
that again, you know, Jatendra also worked, you know, you know, this uh, this particular area for many years, and uh, so particularly there were a couple of work that inspired us about the ordering. When you do texture synthesis, about the ordering, that means you know which part of the image you synthesize first. Now, now remember we have this big missing hole. Now, if I ask the audience, what do you think? Which part you should fill in first? Now, you should fill in the middle unknown picture, pixel first, or should fill you know next to the boundary? Oh, it's pretty intuitive, but how? Still unknown. People tried that and didn't have very good result. So when we actually looked at this problem, we actually used you know, the, the state-of-art algorithm from uh, no, no, our colleagues in Cambridge for this particularly difficult example. Say we have a boy here, and we mark this blue region out, and then we <coughs> fill in, get the result like this. So that was uh, when we looked at this problem in 2004. That was the state-of-art. Now, now I'm actually surprised no one in the audience laughed looking at this picture. Right. Something is wrong with this picture. <laughs> right. See? But I would say, well, you know, for those students who actually laugh at this picture, I would say, no, no, you, you got to be careful. I mean, even get to this point is not easy. Now, I would say, and you know, I don't know, of course, Berkeley has very high standard. No, I would say my Tsinghua student, if he can get this far, I give him a master. <laughs> It's, it's very difficult. I mean, believe me, right? This is just very difficult. And, uh, but the problem is that you look at this result, you say, something is wrong. I mean, how could we get the, the stair like this? I think, you know, those construction workers in Berkeley would never do that. Maybe people in China do this. <laughs> uh, maybe not. You know, so, so the reason that this is wrong, because there are two reasons. There are two, really two reasons. One is, you know, in terms of algorithm. You know, the previous you know, algorithm you know, was greedy. So if you're greedy, then you cannot guarantee you know, the results are always right. But that's not the, the, the most important thing, in my opinion. The most important thing is, unfortunately, we human, we human beings, you know, over the years, have developed such a strong prior in our, in, our, in our minds that if this is something constructive, you know, if it's a straight line, it better be straight. If it's curved line, it better be curved. And you look at this thing and say, that's not right. That's broken. There's something wrong, you know, not fit, not, not right with the uh, with, uh, human prior. So that's something we just have to incorporate in our system to make something convincing. So let me show you our result before I get to you know, how we actually do that. This is what we did. Of course, we need a little bit of help, you know, interactively. I get to that point as well. So, I want you also, before I present the wonderful mathematics behind that, I want to you know, introduce a little bit of motivation here. You know, we, we are in this business of image understanding, and uh, you know, we all understand that image understanding is difficult. And uh, you know, what is in the image is also very, very difficult. Let's just take a look at this, this picture here, right? And the nice, simple picture. If I remove the pumpkin, and it, then I say, well, what's really behind the pumpkin? Right? Well, it's not clear. But if you look at the picture, you say, well, you know, with all my you know, human prior you know, over the years, I, I, I look at this thing, I say, well, that looks like a window. A window. Now, what is a window? Well, what is a window? I have a five-year-old, and uh, you know, I actually keep learning from this guy you know, how he, he learns things. And if I say, Matthew, can you draw a window? Yeah, he will draw a window. How would he draw a window? And he would draw something like this. Right? Now, now I deliberately also removed that part of the pumpkin, the broken structure here, and I show you a little animation here, probably convincing you the missing structure here. It's a very simple, actually. If that is the frame, if that's the window, then basically what we're missing are two short line segments. That's really a key observation you know, by my student, Jan. He came up with this idea you know, here. It's the missing salient structure here is only a few lines or curves. As simple as that. So that's actually what's really going on. So if we specify where we miss you know, those lines, and suppose we have a way to fill in the content along those two lines, horizontal vertical lines, I haven't told you how we do that. Very quickly, we'll get to that point. Now we can fill that part. Then we still have those blue pixels missing. 
But by then, you know, we actually have some way to deal with that. You know, we just do this wonderful texture synthesis work and uh, fill those blue pixels just like this. So that suggests this two-step approach here. You know, and with this second observation, is actually this filling in order. So we have to fill in structures first before we fill in the texture you know, with a little bit of help of interactivity. So here is our approach. Let's say we have this missing region here. The pumping is gone. Then what are you going to do? Well, please draw two lines indicating you know, the structure and uh, where it's missing. Then we do the, something we call the structure propagation. You know, get the results like this. Then we do texture propagation and get the final results like that. So now to get to the, my favorite point, favorite part of my talk is really you know, how we you know, formulate this problem mathematically. So here is a very simple example I show you, you know, how we actually do this. Suppose we took this uh, very nice you know, picture, the you know, beach, and the uh, you know, water, and the sand. And then unfortunately, the middle part is missing. A big part of the middle is missing. And by now, really, you know, only God knows what's behind. You really, you really don't know. But that's OK. You know. Now you tell me what in your mind you think that should be. And very simple, only thing you need to tell me is where is the water line? So why don't you draw a water line like this? I, I don't know whether it should be like this. You, know, you tell me, you just draw a water line like this. That's all you need to do. I take care of the rest. And uh, with this line, we can formulate the problem to something we call graph labeling. It's basically saying, well, inside this frame, the box here, and uh, if we along the line, we discretize every note. Then basically, say, I'm saying everything inside the box, every note inside the box, I just don't know. I'd like to label each note using other known notes along this line, outside of the box. So that's the problem. So that's really you know, what we do. So we try to copy a note, of course, along with the texture you know, nearby. And it, from outside the box, inside the box, and uh, that's just the graph labeling problem. Assign a label you know, for each note, a known note from those known ones. And uh, that's again a simple energy minimization problem that we have to formulate. And the first thing is really for each you know, you know, note that you want to match to others, you, know, you just have to look at the structure, you know, the structure of the line, you know, say which ones actually match well. If you actually have a note that's actually the neighbor, you know, uh, have texture as well, then you have to take care of the texture part. And for any two notes next to each other, then you have to put those two notes together, and the overlapping part, they have to match. Now, those are two energy terms you do. And that problem turns out to be a beautiful dynamic programming problem because it's 1D, and that you can solve that easily by writing down all those you know, energy terms, and we all learned. And, uh, get that solved very quickly. So that's the result. And uh, therefore, armed with this mathematical, you know, the dynamical programming algorithm, and we can fill in everything along this line, just like that. That's what we got. Now with this line, we also nicely, nicely segment the image into two parts, in the top part and the bottom part. And in texture synthesis literature, in computer graphics and the, in the vision, and there's something called a synthesis by numbers. You synthesize the unknown region one, you know, using the known region one, and you synthesize a unknown dark region two using the known region two. So that's this way we fill in the water and uh, fill in the sand. Uh, that's what you get. Very simple. So that's how we get that. Of course, you know, we certainly you know still care about the dog. You know, what are we going to do with the dog? I mean, with a very complex thing like this, all we need to do is really only two lines. We draw two lines indicating the missing structure. And we get the structure, and we get that. Yeah. Now, now if you sit back there, look at this picture, you say, that looks like a perfect picture. Then if you look very, very hard, then you say, something may be not right. Then you stare at that for five, ten seconds. Then your eyes get blurred. You say, that is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so, Certainly, you can extend that to you know, three lines as well. And uh, let's say you, know, you don't like this car, and they just remove it, and they draw three lines. Then you get the sky, get the water, get the sand, and uh, boom. That's what it is. And uh, then you're happy. Until you realize that's not the end of the story. You say, well, what if you actually have 
lines intersecting. So if you actually remove this bird, then you draw a few lines to indicating where the fence is. Now you actually have a new problem. So why you have a problem? Because now you actually have a 2D graph and uh, with this intersecting nodes. You know. Why is this a problem? Because dynamic programming doesn't work efficiently anymore. It's not like a dynamic pro programming it doesn't work. It's just it's not efficient anymore. And uh, it doesn't bother us because we go back to the literature and some very smart people have already figured out something called the belief propagation. Actually, Judea Pearl did that a long time ago and recently picked up by learning and vision in the community and they continue to improve that and what's going on. And uh, it's not my purpose to teach you belief propagation, but the basic idea there is once you have a graph, then you just have all those beliefs you know, sending to each other, then you do that you know, iteratively and you propagate that and then the, finally you can converge to some results. And this again is an energy minimization problem. And I'm just going to show you and some early version we did with the belief propagation, this iterate, iteration, and the, <coughs> the number of iterations you know, is fixed. And uh, uh, for this particular graph, the convergence to the optimal is guaranteed. So let's get these results like that. And uh, now here's just a few more words about you know, what's really going on with, uh, with the belief propagation. And if you look at the 2D graph without loop, if you have a tree like the, the example we have just shown you, and you guarantee to get the optimal solution, and the number of convert you know, the steps you know is uh, is known. If you do have loops, the the graph becomes more complicated. If you have only one loop, you know, people already proved that. In the year year wise, the Freeman they actually proved that you can get the, still get the result, optimal result. If you actually have more than two loops, and then you can only get the approximate solution. The fortunate for us, most of the examples we care about, we are not going to have millions of those loops, and. Uh, just to show you an example uh, that does work you know, on the real experiments. Now, let's say we remove the horse and the, and the kid and draw a few lines like this. This is still just a tree. The unknown pixels there, we actually don't have a loop for this example. So we know we should get the good results just like this. So that's, that's given. But what if we make it arbitrarily difficult by adding one more vertical bar here, then we just force ourselves to sol solve a new loopy belief propagation problem, then we get a result like that, and uh, just as nice as before. So that's, uh, that's the result. Now by now you may ask, how did you know there is a vertical bar here? I don't know. Yeah. So let me show you a few more demos that uh, on, uh, what we have done and, uh, on the image uh, completion. Yeah. The nice thing about the image completion is that now you can really manipulate your pictures. Whatever you don't like, just eliminate it. Yeah. So if you don't like modern arts, I don't know you why. But uh, you can eliminate it. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't like anyone walking in front of you, yeah, just remove. And uh, this is an example I want to take it slow so that you see some uh, issues with this kind of approach. I want to do the back and the forth a couple of times so that you understand. Let me just direct your attention to this part of the shadow here. By the way, we remove both the person and the shadow altogether. It might be a little difficult for those at the back. Let me just say this is the result. Let's see, this is the original. This is the result. This is the original. So please look at it here. So I, just, I want to show you, you know, actually, you know, this is actually completely different. So this is the result. The different, right. So it's different. And there's another thing I want to point out is that I, after I show this demo to someone for quite a, no, a few minutes, a few minutes later, someone will come up with the question and say, hmm, that doesn't look right. I say, what's not right? He said, why did you have this guy here? That looks exactly like this. <laughs> yeah, I said, that's the point. That's exactly like this, because I copied it. Yeah. Well, what else can I do? No, you just have to come up from somewhere, right? And we, right now, constrain our problem with a single image. You know, certainly, you can imagine, what if you have multiple images? What are you going to do? So, but that's the point I want to make. And there are more examples here, like you don't like a clown. That's fine. And uh, you don't like an old bike. No, you really want to get a new one? Good. Get rid of the old one. So you travel to somewhere and you came back home and your mom said, what is foreign language saying? You said, I don't know. Let me just remove it before dad asks me again. Yeah. <laughs> so you can do some home decoration. No, just like this, simple. This is actually pretty difficult and it needs quite a few strokes there, lines there to get the result. This is the most difficult one we did. And it's a, it's a very difficult one. We just removed the statue altogether. 
So get a result like this. It took us about 20 some lines. And uh, now this is an example I really like, and I think you know why everyone should use Harry's software. You go travel to some place, and you know after you no know, trying error, say, "Well, oh, this is a perfect angle. I really want to take a picture here." But some people are just annoying. You know, <laughs> they just don't leave. And what can you do? You know, you, you know your, your tour guide says the bus is leaving. You really have to get back, so you have to just snap a shot, and you go back digitally remove them. Yeah. So that's what it. Yeah. Uh, certainly, you shouldn't stop here. You know, you can imagine, you can come up with some creativity. You know, what you can do? Say you remove the, you know, um, some part you don't like, and you reconstruct the you know, letter like this. You know, so the house looks cleaner. But you, you know, you can think about you know some creative way. How about the wavy letter? You no, know, you can actually come up with a wavy letter just like this. You know, last time I went to Home Depot, they do sell something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Or you can you know, manipulate the images in some other ways as well. Now you have this system. Let's say you, know, you go to a beach, then you're not happy. You know, it's not as big as it's you know, promised. I said, why, why worry? You know, just draw the line and also tell me where, how big you want to be. Boom, you have a new beach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly you can also do a lot of animation. You know, now you have the foreground and the background. Now you can you know, let the bird fly. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, not only one, you can have more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this is my favorite uh, uh, demo, actually. It's a single picture. You get the foreground, you get the background, then you just uh, hallucinate the, 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 the 3D camera view. Now you actually have uh, you know, two into picture, the three-dimensional you know, you know, feeling. You know. Now please observe the camera angle is going down and up, and uh, all from a single image. And uh, so it's something you know, you know, people call the two into picture and a beautiful cigarette paper in 97 by you know, three Japanese researchers. So I just uh, used their name, you know, two, two into the picture. So let me also summarize this, this system as well. So I call it interactive image completion. And the, the, again, the, the really you know, what's, what's interesting here is more on the UI side. You look at the picture, you say, well, something's missing. But can I come up with a user interface for the user so that the user can specify what he or she thinks? A few lines, a few curves, and then you incorporate the kind of constraints you know, from the context and from the prior. Of course, you need those wonderful you know, no, uh, belief propagation engine you know, underneath to give you very quick you know, feedback in the results. So that's the second system we talked about. And uh, what I'm really proposing here and is not that you know, we shouldn't continue those wonderful you know, vision algorithms, automatic algorithms. I think we should continue. And, uh, but solving your post vision problem is really, really difficult. And the one way to do that is to incorporate user-specified priors. So I'm proposing that you know, this new, you know, the, the, what Takeo Kanade calls you know, in branch of computer vision, uh, interactive computer vision. So there are two things here you know, we have to study. You know, one is this intuitive user interface for users to specify you know, the kind of constraints, the priors, you know, specify the priors. The, then, the secondly, we need to continue to develop the new algorithms to make things faster and faster you know, with the help of the computers. But if you, continue, if you, if you push me you know, back to the wall, say, Harry, tell me one thing we really should work on and say something different from Jatendra. Well, I would say, well, we really need to have more students, especially students from Berkeley, to think more about the user interface. And the U UI, you know, intuitive UI, you know, how we incorporate human priors. Because you know, that, that's really very, very, very important. And uh, I think about the, there are a lot of things that we can do if we can actually make some progress along this line. You know, even picture coding. You know, if we can come up with something that's useful with human specified prior, you know, we can even help you know, picture coding. Not to mention that you know, this uh, holy grail of computer vision, you know, image understanding, Perhaps what we need to do today is actually build more tools like lazy snapping and the image completion, such that, such that we get a lot of pictures from Flickr, from the web, and we can prepare a lot of useful ex, you know, experimental data, such that we can train you know, our system to finally do automatic image you know, recognition or understanding by you know, using this kind of bootstrapping. You know, that's, uh, all I can tell today. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
happy to take some questions then. <laughs> yes? At, at one time, uh, you could take a photograph and say, this is how things really were. And now, you can take a photograph and you say, things aren't like this anymore. <laughs> I go into a courtroom and they laugh at me. <laughs> what do you do about that legal problem? That's a very good question. I get this kind of questions. Uh, uh, people start to, uh, a lot of people start to look at this, and uh, both from the technology point of view and also from the uh, legal point of view. Can we trust those pictures anymore? How can we detect doctored images? And how can we detect the doctored videos? And uh, 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 technically, we still don't have any good and reliable solutions. Um, so. Uh, I, 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 just, I think this is just a very difficult problem. We worked on this problem uh, for a couple of years. We're still you know, far from you know, something useful. Yeah. There's Maybe it's a tangent. Yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's a cool example from uh, George Bush's campaign where they have released <laughs> a picture where they showed lots of uh, soldiers in the audience. Oh, that's right. And it was actually done by a texture synthesis. Oh, that's right. <laughs> the way we know that that they were identical copies. That's right. So I think Harry showed in his That's picture right. this. <laughs> it's really copying pixels from one place to another. Right, right. So, so you have this identicalness effect which can't happen in real life. And uh, that showed that Bush's lying extended to <laughs> picture manipulation as well. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have a Bushy algorithm then. <laughs> 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 Image segmentation. I saw some perfect image segmentation results from papers that I published 10 years or 15 years ago. Uh, after involving humans into such kind of uh, image completion, image segmentation problem, there might be more issues related with how to compare one researcher's result with other researchers' result in an unbiased way. Have you uh, given some of your comments about how to compare uh, your Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. I think that's uh, no, really a question that uh, no, the senior leaders and the people like Jitendra should really, <laughs> uh, in our community, should really uh, think about it. And uh, over the course of computer vision research, I mean, as, as, at least you know, the 15, 20 years I have been involved, we have been always talking about that whether we should have the, the, the standard database, should we force people to you know, run on those databases. At one point, we even talked about no PAMI papers should be allowed without you know, doing those experiments on the thing. But no, nothing happened. You know, we are liberal people. You know, I mean, people from Berkeley, you cannot force them to do anything. You know. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's just very hard. And, uh, but I think uh, you know, nowadays we do get a chance. We do get a chance because now we have web. The way of you know, deploying things and uh, the way of delivering things is just becoming so much easier. And they look at you know, the, the incredible phenomenon like you know, you know, Flickr, like YouTube, and all those things. Uh, I think that our research community also making a lot of efforts. You know, a good example is actually uh, Shastin and Zelisky's uh, uh, stereo database where people can take the same data set, do the experiment, upload the results, and so that people can compare. Uh, but the, we just got to be realistic that it's not like every graduate student is very proud about you know, giving out those buggy code to other people to try. So, and not every professor is willing to use the research staff to package things very well so other people can build things on. Maybe you know places like Microsoft Research can can you know, do more things here, but uh, I think it's uh, it's really a collective effort for the whole community. Yeah. So, so I guess deciding who knows best is kind of a contentious issue. But can, can we measure how hard the problem is? In some way? Can you <laughs> like, you know, how much complexity there is in this image versus right. that image, or, or how hard it is to do a particular task? Right. Some way to measure this. Uh, you mean segmentation? Uh, or anything? Arbitrary problems right. In Asian graphics, right. Right. <laughs> And the one problem with interactive work is actually people always argue, say, oh, once you use interactive method, of course you, know, you get the best result. But I would argue that before I told you, you know, how I draw a few lines, now I would say you probably couldn't figure this out, not in a couple of hours. No. So, so, the, the, so it's kind of hard. And the, then people say, well, then should we just compare 
automatic algorithms. Well, I think fair, you know, compared to just automatic algorithms. And uh, to come up with the, the kind of fair data sets and to come up with the right measure, and it's just very, very hard. You know, we're still arguing what is the perceptual metric you know, for compression, right? And I mean, things like uh, segmentation. You know, is this RMS error per pixel is really the right measure? You know, and uh, you know, whether you, know, you miss grossly you know, some boundary that you really shouldn't, you know, should be you know, more important. Those are still continue to be difficult problems. And, you know, I, I, I have to come back you know, to Berkeley more often to ask Chitanjou how to do those things. Yeah. Back to your dog, right? So you have a couple of spots and you took the dog away, right? Yes. Okay, so there are two questions. The first one, let's assume you have another picture where the dog is there, but it's just from the different angle. In that case, you should not have any need for the stroke. Is that correct? I, I, I actually so missed like, your question. So the first one, like you took the picture of right. the dog and you stroke and then you took the dog out of the right. picture. Right, right. Now let's have another picture okay. at a different angle. Yeah. Do we need a stroke for the other picture? Good question. Good, good question. Good question. That's actually the hope, and I mentioned that. Uh, in fact, uh, the, what I mean by bootstrapping the understanding problem is actually if we have enough dog data, suppose we have enough dog data that we actually, you know, you know ask all the graduate students to do this and they get the, you know, the training data. How many do we need? Let me ask you. How many of those dog images do we need? Nicely segmented. You know, how many? Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands? We don't know yet, and. Uh, uh, last summer, I ran a, a small workshop in Lhasa, Tibet, with a, a bunch of computer vision people. I tried very hard to get the Chitanjou. He refused to, to go. And uh, we called the workshop a computer vision summit because we were at Lhasa. <laughs> and uh, I thought with this title, you know, Chitanjou you know, wouldn't miss it, but he still, you know, his, uh, his kid is more important than, you know, seeing those, uh, you know, lousy vision people. And uh, uh, at one point, we were debating, you know, exactly this question. Then I just got really mad. I say, is this really that difficult? I mean, can we just uh, sit down and solve this problem once for all? Let's have dog detection and the cat detection. I, I took a bunch of students. I said, any of you get the dog detection right and the cat detection? I will give you a PhD, not a master, PhD. <laughs> and I'll, I'll hack a postdoc. <laughs> and we came back, and of course, you know, you know, in China, you actually can give orders. You know, and so, uh, Three months later, my students came to my office and said, oh, Harry, we, we, we're just very sorry. I think we just have to give up 50% of your order. I said, which 50? He said, we cannot do dogs. <laughs> I said, how about a cat? <laughs> he said, cat is hopeful. <laughs> 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 well, without telling you how we do it, and uh, let me just say, you know, I'm, uh, opti I'm cautiously optimistic uh, in, in possibly submitting an ICCV paper <laughs> That, that on cat that Jitendu, if you review that paper, please say this is a great paper. Should it, we should accept it? <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, it, we, we are we are in very uh, it's a great question. We are in early stage of this bootstrapping this understanding problem. Uh, it's such a difficult problem you know, with different views, angles, appearance, all those things. We don't know the minimum sampling yet. I think anyone who writes a paper on that topic you know, should get at least the mass prize. Yeah. He. Yeah. Oh, there are many. I mean, we are researchers. That's why the difference between research and the product, and uh, I learned the hard way. And as a research, you guys, you know, if it doesn't work, we just sweep under the rug. And, uh, and the most, uh, I actually, lazy snapping works really, really well. That's why it's in a product now. But the second part of my talk, it, it doesn't work very well for most of the images, let's be honest. And uh, I didn't bring that picture. Typically, I have a, an image I like to show people why you know, image completion only works for very limited cases. Suppose you have a, you know, airline, a airplane picture. Suppose you just uh, remove part of the cockpit. There's no way you can fill in because the rest of the picture, you just cannot steal. But then you can, ar you can argue, excuse me, that what if I have another picture very similar and then still hopeful? So we, we have to take it step by step. With the current system, it's severely limited in the applicability. Right. Perhaps I don't understand the picture coding, but is it easier to use Japanese, excuse me, Chinese written characters versus... Japanese is the same. <laughs> <laughs> my, my era, I beg your pardon, but it, with the multiplicity of J 
Chinese characters, are you better off using the characters rather than the English words? Yeah, that's uh, that's that's really a that's really a good question, and uh, um, it's I guess you know it, it it has to really you know go back to the problem of granularity. You know, you know at what level you want to study this problem. See, picture coding. I uh, I'm not really an expert, but uh, my understanding is that you know really in terms of the technology, you know after zero retrieval, we, we've led and there's very little you know, uh, you know big jump you know in. The, because you know that at the signal level, that's what we pretty much understand. My my hope is actually I think you know maybe you know if we can have some kind of human prior, user specified prior that uh, incorporate there, as you said, say if we know that part is a character, is a particular character, say horse, and with that understanding, that gives us a lot more information that we can use to code that part of the image. And uh, we have uh, uh, some colleagues in the, in the Microsoft Research Asia actually trying some preliminary ideas there. Uh, but there is no major breakthrough you know, I can report yet. Yeah, so. I think that's, uh, Hank Harry, there's yeah. uh, some uh, goodies outside. OK.